Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Dave Rodman. With Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies reclaiming all-time highs, regulatory uncertainty is still very high in the cryptocurrency industry. There's certainly a lot of moving parts and lack of clarity in this new industry. And you won't want to miss this episode with Dave Rodman going into detail on the state of regulation, where we are now, and what's needed for this space to thrive and continue to grow. Before we jump into the episode, I wanted to take a second to thank you for all the great questions and feedback I've been getting. You guys really, really rock. It's awesome. If you're getting some sort of value from this podcast, please drop me a line or leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. These things really mean a lot. There we go. All things cryptocurrency regulation with Dave Rodman. Enjoy. Welcome to the show, Dave. Glad to have you today. Good to be here. So we were talking before we recorded, um, you actually were podcast episode number one about four or five, five months ago now. And uh, some of the difficulties that come with being podcast number one are somebody doesn't understand uh, how to make the sound sound very good. So uh, that episode got scrapped. And here we are again, beginning of December, Definitely not episode number one, but I will congratulate you for being episode number one on the podcast, regardless of when this is being published. Well, thank you, man. I mean, uh, that actually means a lot now because you have had some pretty awesome people uh, on here since uh, that very awkward and technical glitchy day that we sat down to do this the first time. Absolutely. It's it's amazing how, how nerve wracking it actually is and getting it going. So uh, definitely grateful for you to to work with me through those things. Now, you know, having people like Jim Rogers on the channel, it's, a, it's an absolute dream. So, but either way, it's all about you today. So I'm really excited to have you on. Um, I really... I think my my listeners will really enjoy a lot of your your depth of experience within crypto and cannabis and securities law. Um, but before we get into all those things, I just wanted to start off a little bit about you, uh, your background, what you do. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in uh, Colorado, um, and I, uh, I I you know went to school at Tufts University, uh, worked in finance for a couple years. Um, in New York City for Merrill Lynch. Ended up uh, not staying there because I saved Merrill about three and a half billion dollars of uh, uh, credit exposure. Uh, and they gave me a $1,500 bonus and no raise. So I quit. So I took three weeks vacation and then I quit. And then I went to law school. Um, in between the two is actually where I met you uh, when you were my bar back at a bar in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, and then I went to law school and started my own firm. Um, got, got started uh, in the cannabis space uh, kind of by accident and really grew to love it because it sort of fit my, um, sort of my mindset, not, not from like a, a you know, pro cannabis standpoint, but just from a, sort of a, a, a legal geek kind of where are the gray areas uh, analysis uh, really appealed to me and have been doing that uh, ever since. I have six attorneys working with me now. Um, and and uh, in 2006, 617, 2000, wait, yeah, 2017 is when you actually got me interested, back interested in crypto. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 and forgot about it for uh, a while. Um, and then right before like the ICO boom, uh, you and I started talking about crypto and I have been hooked ever since. So it's all your fault. I, should, man. I, I don't know if I should apologize or <laughs> say you're welcome. Either I think way. you're welcome is probably the right one. Yeah. So you got your first Bitcoin in 2013. Mm hmm. That's crazy early. But uh, then 2017, I mean, you and I uh, started talking about crypto quite a bit, getting really interested. And you ended up helping set up all things legal for one of my first companies within the crypto space. So definitely can attest to your knowledge and depth of experience within the space. That's for sure. I'm, I'm curious, though. I, I mean, obviously, you, you started getting more involved in crypto in 2017. But what 
interests you most about crypto and the space in general? I think I could spend the entire uh, podcast talking about what interests me in the space, but I think that money is the last great frontier for tech. And I think that the application of programmable money uh, and programmable assets is truly something that we haven't fully, even those of us who are deep in it, haven't fully comprehended. Um, I think that, you know, just as an easy example, I mean, I trained as a securities lawyer. I think that eventually there are components of this that could make securities law basically, or at least securities, securities lawyers uh, obsolete, um, rather than needing an opinion letter about whether or not someone could hold a, a certain asset. In theory, these things could all be plugged right into the smart contract and you would be, I mean, there's the, there's the, there's the, the light side of that and then there's the dark side of that. Uh, on one side, on one hand, you could make it so that no one would ever, you would never ever violate a securities law. On the other hand, you could drastically mo uh, monitor and restrict people from being able to do things. And so you get like the, you know, and, one, and I think we'll probably talk about this a bunch because you and I have talked about it privately a, a lot. There's like the, the uh, clear eyed and, and uh, idealistic, you know, ETH programmer view on all this stuff. And then there's like the, the dystopian aspect of this that could really easily happen. Um, so I didn't really answer the question today. Um, what, well, so I guess, yeah. Those are very interesting aspects. So those the most interesting aspect for you with crypto? Um, I mean, that and like the democratization of, of, of finance. I mean, the fact that you've got a whole generation of crypto geeks now who are talking about uh, interest rates and, and yield and, and things that, that no one would have paid attention to. Most of those people, most of those people wouldn't have paid, paid attention to. Uh, pre, well, pre uh, DeFi, but uh, in general, I think that there has been a lot of um, intellectual capital that's being poured into this space and that is super exciting. Absolutely, I mean, I, I forget where it was, but long ago I heard Bitcoin explained as the mind virus, because as soon as you start thinking about Bitcoin, you start understanding the way that it works and then you start questioning money and you start kind of questioning everything else and it's kind of unraveling the sweater as you go through and it leads you to reading you know books like the creature from jekyll island and all of these things that sovereign individual all of these things that we've gone down so it's uh it's certainly it is absolutely interesting as hell that's for sure um so I, I, I love with your background in securities law and I think it, um, and, the, and then cannabis, I think it provides you a, a unique view and perspective within the uh, crypto space. But, you know, from backing up for a bit from a legal perspective, let's talk about crypto. Like paint me a picture of the current state of regulation within crypto. Where do we stand from a regulatory uh, standpoint? So, I think that if I were to say what I'm about to say to somebody in the in the ICO boom of 2017, they would, you know, be shocked. But I think that the answer to that is that we haven't seen then or now crypto regulations yet. I think as of right now, you can think of it as the sleeping giant of uh regulatory agencies is still asleep or maybe is just starting to wake up. Uh, and has we've mostly seen it ignore the space. Of course, the Telegram uh, and Kick uh, enforcement accent, uh, actions um, were big deals. I mean, they were they were definitely chilling for the space. But at the end of the day, we're talking about the SEC, and that's it. Uh, we we have not seen. I think that the. Um, the Stable Act is, an, is a good example of what could be, uh, what could be coming down the pipe. Uh, the example of people who may not kind of understand what they're doing, trying to legislate. Um, I think that right now there is sort of a live and let live um, uh, sense within the, within the regulator business uh, dichotomy. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be the case much longer. And, uh, and I think you're going to see 
bigger, uh, bigger enforcement, more enforcement, uh, more laws, more fights, and it'll be more than just um, the Howey test and the SEC. I think that'll be small potatoes compared to what's coming. And, and for me, I mean, obviously I follow uh, regulation changes and these things within the space, but it, it seems like, I mean, there's another, a number of different regulatory authorities that kind of have something to do with crypto. So, I mean, at the SEC, obviously the CF, CFTC, there's a, there's a number of three letter, four letter alphabet soup that have something to do. Can you, uh, are you familiar enough to give me kind of a broad explanation of who does what and where the yeah. lines are? So um, I think the biggest one that you left off that list is IRS. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. Oh, that, um, other, but, that other one, yeah. Yeah, uh, so obviously SEC uh, regulates securities um, and uh, CFTC regulates uh, current um, commodities. And, and basically CFTC has said Ethereum and Bitcoin we're going to, that's commodities, like currency trading, we're going to take that here. And then basically everything else seems to sort of fit the uh, SEC's definition um, of a security in one way or another. Um, but that leaves off uh, the OCC, um, the, uh, just, I mean, just straight up DHS, Department of Homeland Security, that's going to be a huge component to this. Um, FinCEN is largely been ignored, um, and that's that's one that we've got a lot of experience with from from cannabis work. Um, FinCEN is scary. You gotta be careful with FinCEN. Um, so FinCEN, I'm not familiar with what that acronym stands for. Just for my listeners, uh, what does it stand for? So it stands for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. It's a department. Uh, it's, a, it's a bureau in the Treasury, um, and it basically. Uh, regulates the the actual pipelines of currency. Um, so, uh, when you go to the bank and you deposit uh, ten thousand more than ten thousand dollars of cash in a day, or twelve thousand and change in a year, uh, you have the, the bank slash you fills out a CTR, which stands for a currency transaction report. Um, which basically logs that. So this idea of cash being truly untraceable is is not the case if these financial institutions follow the rules. And um, you know, the, the, a little bit of a segue or a, an aside here. I mean, people are are kind of oh, Bitcoin is how terrorists finance uh, bad deeds and stuff. It's no, it's, it's U.S. dollars, and uh, the correspondent banks in the SWIFT system clearly aren't doing their job because we've seen that Deutsche Bank got uh, had that FinCEN leak of the billions and billions of dollars of not reported dollar transactions. And that's just dollars. I mean, forget euros, forget yuan. Um, that's just dollars, which as the reserve currency, we kind of are able to keep a hold of right now, but that's not going to stay that way. Um, so, so anyway, so if you don't have, if you're trying to avoid the CTR, uh, reports, then the banks are supposed to file SARs, which stands for uh, suspicious activity. And that, that, can, that can lead to trouble uh, if, you're, if you're basically leads to allegations of money laundering. Um, I'm kind of hopping a yeah. little bit, but that's- No, that's and that's fine. But like, that's only if this cash touches the banking system, right? If I give you a big bag, bag full of cash and you give that bag full of cash to somebody else, like those transactions are pretty, untraceable right that's that's correct but like so if it truly does stay outside the system yes but at some point someone's gonna use that bag of cash for not just giving it to another person like whether that's buying uh, a vehicle or a piece of property um or paying a contractor who then wants to go and do those things eventually and that's sort of like the 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 accordion effect on this is eventually it gets into the banking system and then it's like, well, how'd you get it? And you're supposed to have been, even if, even if you didn't actually put it into the banking system, if you are a non-individual, if you are a business, you are supposed to be keeping track of that. Even if you were all cash, you're supposed to have been doing all that stuff as if, as if you were in the system. So the minute, minute somebody goes off and fails to, uh, and, and, and triggers that sort of like, touch with the regulatory world, 
there is absolutely a way in which people are trying to figure out where that money came from. And um, I mean, that's how, that's how money laundering uh, uh, schemes are always end up failing is that there's some, somebody cracks, somebody makes a mistake and the whole thing balloons. A, a perfect segue into CBDCs, but we're not going to go there yet, but rest assured we will, because there are a number of issues with the current system and the way that it's set up uh, and, and all roads kind of point to cash is archaic and doesn't make any sense, but we'll lead into that a little bit later. Um, so with the different regulatory bodies, the different regulations that do exist, the ones that are, are slated to come out, like where are the massive holes? Like I constantly working in the cryptocurrency industry, I just constantly hear we need regulatory clarity or we need some sort of some sort of clarity on regulations to help the space go forward. And I listened to a good podcast with the CFTC chairman talking about, you know, you don't want to squander innovation and kind of let things go. So it sounds like they're always playing this delicate balance. But uh, in, in your opinion, your legal opinion, like what sort of regulation would, if, if, if uh, enacted or if given, would, would provide a lot of clarity that would really help propel the space go forward? So there's a couple of answers to that, I think. Um, first of all, uh, Chairman Tarbett is definitely uh, on, this for, on the side of good as far as I'm concerned in this industry. Um, and I, I wish that uh, Chairman Clayton had followed his his example. Um, and hopefully, when Clayton retires, uh, we'll get Crypto Mom in his place. That's, that's kind of our, you know, that would be, that'd be fantastic for the industry. But um, I think broadly, we can zero in on some stuff in a second. But broadly, what we need is a regulatory sandbox where it's like, okay, okay this we we the, the U.S. government recognizes that like. We haven't figured everything out for this. And if you if you if we put some broad parameters in here, you can basically do anything short of fraud. You know, you're you're own, you know, you're never gonna be able to uh, you never would want to nor be able to contract around fraud. But if you were to be able to put some some borders in it and kind of let everybody play around, I think that that would be the best possible result for every aspect of this industry. Now, whether or not that happens. I'm not convinced that failure to do that is going to stop the industry as a whole. What I think it could do is it could severely challenge uh, United States citizens from participating and from contributing and from reaping benefits of this technology. Um, so basically, the, you know, if we to try to stamp it out, it's, it's just going to go somewhere else and it's no longer going to, we're never going to, we're not going to be at the forefront of that. And I think that at the beginning of the internet, um, I think regulators really understood that um, and took that sort of approach, which allowed us, I mean, look at the last 30 years of tech growth. It's a direct uh, uh, outgrowth of um, the, uh, the way the Communications Decency Act was, was sort of, hands off. I mean, this, they call it the, the 26 words that founded the internet, um, which basically says that uh, service providers and, and, and um, uh, network providers aren't publishers. Um, and that, that we could probably loop back around to that when we get to DeFi, I mean, to NFTs. But uh, so yeah, the sandbox would be really good for the space. Um, but I guess the way I would look at it is, our lack of regulation is going to be bad for the space. And yes, it'll be bad for the American space, um, but it'll just go somewhere else. Uh, and at this point, Bitcoin isn't going anywhere. And if all of a sudden it was illegal in the United States to hold Bitcoin, all the institutional in interest would just spin up subsidiaries in other countries and still get exposure to it. I think that we'll probably see... Uh, dev teams continue to push the envelope and to innovate until the point, and I, and I, and I, I hope this, this doesn't happen, but I have a feeling that it will, some, dev, some US based dev team is going to do something wrong or, or run afoul of some regulation and they are gonna get hammered. And I don't know what that's gonna be, I don't know whether that'll be civil or whether that'll be criminal, 
but that is where you will see a change in in action because i mean think about it the the copyright and trademark laws have been around forever and that didn't deter napster that didn't deter kazaa you know these guys went up against the might of the recording industry and basically totally reshaped that uh, entire market so it's you're never going to stifle that innovation but but i think adding money to this adding the actual subject of this basically being money and the power of the patriot act i think that if we don't take some steps to prom promote sort of a a safe haven here um someone's going some some poor dev is going to get just railroaded and uh it will have chilling effects on on the whole industry yeah and i'm talking about that whole progression of the internet a really good book is how the internet happened from netscape to the iphone by brian mccall um also really really good one about that but i'm, I'm curious so i mean are there any other jurisdictions globally that are doing things right with regulations or you think just hands off let innovation flourish and step in if people kind of cross the line at some point is this the the proper response i can tell you who's doing it wrong switzerland's doing it wrong um with the way they're 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 implementing the equivalent of the travel uh the travel rule which basically says that every every wallet has to have aml kyc i mean i'm i'm bastardizing it a little bit there uh I mean, as of right now, you could argue the U.S. is doing it right by ignoring it. I just think that isn't by design. I think that's sort of just what's happening. It's not, oh, we're going to foster innovation. It's it's not big enough to worry about. And oh, by the way, it's starting to be enough to worry about it. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? I mean, I feel like I'm I'm dodging it. I, I don't think there's any. The, 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 this stuff touches so much. From a legal sense, it touches so many aspects that it would be hard to say, okay, just do this one thing and uh, people will be free to innovate, or or do this two things. It's going to be a well, all right? How do we handle uh, trademarks? How do we handle intellectual property? How do we handle money laundering? How do we want? How do we handle taxes? How do we handle bank secrecy? You know, those things are 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 totally basically totally separate in the in the real world right but this this unique little area brings all of them to bear very 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 tightly and they're all interwoven and so without a true just blanket sandbox which i'm not convinced is going to actually happen i don't think you can you can really eliminate that structural regulatory risk yeah no that makes a lot of sense and this is what people that aren't really following the crypto industry as closely as we are, aren't really aware of how many different industries and niches that it actually does touch. You know, it's Bitcoin, it's Ethereum, but it's it's so much more. I'm I'm curious, what sort of regulations could come out that would just totally torpedo the industry, set it back, you know, push it out from the US and just say, you know what, I can't deal with it anymore. I'm gonna go to another jurisdiction. No Americans can use it. I'm going to block all IPs, et cetera, et cetera. What could you see that would happen that would um, force that? I think uh, I don't even have to uh, theorize here. I think the Staple Act is a perfect example of that, um, which was put out by uh, uh, I forget one of the squad. I can't remember which one. Talib um, and a couple other people sponsored it. And you know, talk about a piece of of not thought through legislation um, basically requires anybody issuing, well, there's two ways of looking at it, but broadly, to anybody issuing a stable coin uh, would have to have a banking license. And <laughs> for those of you just tuning in, uh, banking licenses are really difficult to get. And it takes companies. You know, do you have to get go from a state to get a state charter and then to go from a state charter to a national charter? I mean, it, millions of dollars, tons of lawyers. Just it's it's a there's a reason why there's only you know there's, a, there's not that many national banks. Um, and then 
to force that on something like MakerDAO or um, even USDC, which probably has the best chance of actually satisfying that, is mind boggling. And it's clear that, to me, it's clear these people don't understand what, what they're talking about. And so like the more specific reading of this is, and there's been a bunch of think pieces on this, that even running an Ethereum node, because it has the ability to process DAI transactions, is illegal. And then you get the people on the, on the side of the stable line that say, well, they never would enforce the rules that way. And, you know, that's not something you want, <laughs> that's not something you want to bank on. Okay. Yeah, I, I get it. For me, though, a lot of people I talk to uh, in the space, I mean, I, I run the Crypto Mondays meetup here in LA. So we get a lot of new people and there's always these misconceptions and worries, but one of them is always regulatory risk. Um, I don't want to buy crypto crypto because of regulatory risk. But from your perspective, do you see regulations as a real risk or does it just kind of move to a, regu- a, a jurisdiction that's more favorable in this global age that we live in? Or what would be considered a regulatory risk for a crypto investor that they should worry about? So an, so an investor, it's a different question than from, uh, from like a, an actual innovator, an actual participant. So for an investor, obviously the idea of making Bitcoin illegal, making crypto illegal, uh, I think that can have, that can definitely have some, some negative effect. But as I said earlier, I think that the overall trajectory of something like Bitcoin is no longer really going to be, um, that would cause, you know, a sell off of a certain degree, but it wouldn't destroy it because the rest of the world is using it and institutional guys already have exposure to it and they're going to continue to want that exposure. So they'll just you know, they'll buy it through their, their, their Seychelles uh, subsidiary. Um, does that impact like, you know, the, the little guy, the private citizen? I mean, yeah, I think so. I think it could seriously, uh, you know, people put money into, into this stuff and then eventually need to pay for something in the real world. And if they can't, Pay in a stable coin, they can't make their take their crypto and go back through a fiat, fiat on ramp or off ramp in that case and get whatever you know dollars to pay. Uh, that that'll be a significant risk. But um, so I think, and I think you could. I think the the U.S. absolutely could completely block off the on ramps and off ramps. I think that's a real risk. And for those of us who have any degree of uh, investment in, in this sort of asset, that, that should give you pause. Um, and I don't think that we've even seen the beginning of what this could look like from a, from a negative standpoint. So that, that I would say is a real risk. Uh, that, but if you were able to live entirely within the digital world, um, which some people I think are able to do, then you know, whether you know, they, they can't take their, they can't get a, go on, you take a fiat off ramp into USD, but they're a digital nomad. And so they could get it into euros or they could just live on USDT without having to really have much in the real world. Um, you know, you've got someone like me who's got a mortgage who has to pay that in US dollars. Eventually I have a need and I have to participate in the system. Um, and I, I think that that could seriously slow mass adoption from an investor standpoint, um, but it won't stop it it might delay it slightly and at this point with the big institutional investors involved i i don't think that that really is going to have that kind of impact yeah so that's from the investor standpoint but um what about from the innovator or the 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 company owner entrepreneur what would be these these risks to innovating in the space creating one of these decentralized protocols dApps? Uh, I've got a great one that, for you. That is used uh, by a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there was a, a company recently, and I think it just probably makes sense not to necessarily name them, but uh, they decided to go quote DAO first, and they decided to create. Um, they, they're like, we're not going to have a, a corporate form. We're going to do everything fancy fancy in 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 the distributed distributed in in the, in, in the ether webs. Um, and because of that, we're not going to form a C corp, we're not doing LLC, blah, 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 blah. And it's really cool. I mean, it, it, it takes guts. And, uh, the problem is that law doesn't 
doesn't move that fast. So if someone sues that company, let's say they, they, they actually, let's say they do something by accident, but, but definitely causes some damage. Uh, it hurts somebody, something, loses money, whatever. This is not a criminal. This is not a criminal thing. This is, this is straight civil. If someone sues them, they are probably not going to be able to avoid being treated as a general partnership. So anytime two, two more people get together to conduct business, you don't have to put anything in writing. You don't have to do anything more than say, hey, we're partners. Um, and if you do that, you are general partners in a partnership and you have unlimited liability for the actions of that business and for the actions of your partner. So uh, if, I, if my law firm was a general partnership and we did something incorrect and we got sued, then my entire net worth, all of my assets are at risk because that's, that's, there's no, there's no uh, veil, there's no corporate veil and people could recover against my, they could look, I could lose my house. And so with a simple LLC or a C-Corp, I protect my assets from my business. You know, there's, a, there's a dichotomy there. For those people in that, that, that Dow Force first uh, organization, if something goes wrong, the majority of the people who are involved, all the active, the developers, everybody who would, would be within the corporate, a corporate uh, uh, silo, if it was actually a, a company, they are going to be deemed by the courts, unless something were to happen, which, which I guarantee you it's not going to, they're all going to be general partners and all of their assets are up for grabs. And that's a real world, non-regulatory, tangible, because it's, you know, when you're, when you're fighting against the, the government in a defense like that, I mean, you've got constitutional rights, you've got things that they can and can't do. Uh, regulatory agencies have to follow the, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. Um, when you're fighting against somebody else in civil court, I mean, it's a matter of who can pay the most. You know, you can, I mean, it's a pretty gross uh, simplification, but civil lawsuits, I mean, we routinely tell people who have lost, you know, 15, 20 grand to think really hard about their case if we're going to take it to court for them because they'll probably spend more money uh, just trying to recover. And it's not because we're gouging them or, you know, we, we charge regular fees. It's just, that's how much it costs to litigate. So if they're, they've lost, and, and this is, and this is in a good case with good facts, like clear Johnny was wrong and he's got a great case against Bill. And it's like, well, Johnny, was it more than, was it 30 grand or more? Cause that's what, that's the only way this is going to be profitable for you. It's the only way you're not going to spend money to get that money back. So I, I think that's a, that's an example of the law not catching, not, not, not being anywhere near where the tech is. And that could really, really have some, some massively negative effects for people because they're not going to be able to afford to, they're just going to have to settle and they're going to lose a ton of money. Um, and yeah, so that sort of thing, while very cool in theory, is uh, kind of a, a transactional lawyer's nightmare. Right. And well, these, this is why these legal entities, even though they're from the old system, exist, right? To limit your liability. And without them, you don't have that limited liability. And uh, even though it's this decentralized autonomous organization or DAO, uh, it doesn't protect you legally, which is a very big issue if things go wrong. Um, so I, I wanted to go off on a, a bit of a tangent. We talked um, about, you know, making Bitcoin illegal, cutting out the on and off, off ramps into fiat. But um, what would it look like in, in it most likely for the government, the U.S. government to ban Bitcoin? And I know we said it wasn't likely, but, I, you know, uh, looking back 1933, gold was banned, like the physical ownership of gold, except for certain types. Um, and that lasted until 1975, it's 40 years of just, you couldn't own gold unless it was some sort of specific type of coin. So um, what would a government ban look like? I mean, I think it would look like the Great Firewall of China. Um, I think that it would be, uh, you know, you'd, you'd have embargoes on treasures and ledgers, so you physically couldn't get into the country. Um, I think, though, that... And you know, gold has the 
the storage component, right? So if, if, if really, you know, if you, if you were violating that act and the government really thought you were, they could come search your home um, or search your, your safety deposit box with a warrant. What does that look like in the digital world? Uh, you know, I think that people who, the kind of people who would be breaking that law or the kind of people who are already into this space are the kind of people who are going to make it difficult for that law to be enforced. You know, they, these are the people who know how to use VPNs. These are the people who are going to, you know, write down their, uh, they have a paper wallet somewhere that's stuck in a book. Um, I, I don't think that I, you hear this a lot about people specifically with gold and, and that it was, that it was illegal. I, given the, the, the medium, you know, bits versus pieces of metal and given the day and age and the technology, I don't think it can have the same effect. Chilling. Sure. Uh, but, but you know, that limiting, I don't think so. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, it's just something that con people are constantly talking about. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, my mom and dad have asked me the question like three or four times now. And, um, you know, I, I think that for the individual, for, for, for me answering that question to mom and dad, it's like, well, both me as a son and me as a lawyer, it's like, I can't tell them there's no risk because they could be that one person. You know, well, it's also, uh, I mean, like bank accounts get frozen too, right? So do you have, do you have a pile of gold bars in your house just in case all of your financial accounts get frozen? Like, I mean, how many levels of risks I talked with somebody and he said, well, what if they shut down the internet? What are you going to do with your Bitcoin then? <laughs> so if they shut down the internet, like the last thing I'm worried about is the Bitcoin on my ledger. And I'm more it's worried about cards. the pitchforks and torches that are flying around the city and coming to, you know, kill us all. But yeah. At that point, it it's is. not a question of Bitcoin and gold. It's a question of how much ammunition do you have? Exactly. I'm coming to your house. Um, so, so another one, um, we, we talked about some of the inefficiencies and shortcomings of something like cash. So, CBDCs is a big topic right now. So that stands for central bank digital currencies. So a bit of what we talked about, all of the wonderful benefits of transparency and permanence uh, that come with something like the blockchain could also be used for insane loss of privacy and financial surveillance, but extreme efficiency from a government standpoint in terms of sending out payments, uh, you know, using smart contracts. So it's a, a uh, an expiring stimulus payment, things like that. So I'd like to get your view on CBDCs in general, where you see them now, where you see them potentially going. So I think anybody who says that CBDCs are not inevitable is not informed. I think they are absolutely inevitable. I think that uh, every government will be incentivized to uh, use them. There are the efficiencies, like you said, they are undeniable. Um, they they will be used and it's just a matter of when. Um, and I guess how, the how is the scary part. Um, one would hope that the, the Fourth Amendment would apply to the, U, in the US uh, to the, the use of these things, um, but it's sort of inherently hard, even if the government is perfectly uh, well-intentioned and, and takes all the right steps, the fact that this stuff is all on a ledger and there for everybody to see, um, it's going to be, it's going to, the reason I'm kind of negative on this point is that it will take more effort on the government side and more flawless execution to make a CBDC that isn't this incredible tracking tool than it would like far more orders of magnitude more than it will to implement it. And so that is a terrible combination. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. The government has to execute. And I'm not like a libertarian small government guy. Like I definitely skew liberal. Um, I, I believe in uh, social safety nets. Um, so I don't want to seem like this fringe guy who's like, Oh, the government's bad. But like the government is not known for executing flawlessly or, on time or uh, you know, 
that they were sending checks to dead people for the stimulus package. They're not known for this. And so this tool in their hands, and, and, that's, and that's without them, without the government actively trying to erode public, uh, the private, the privacy um, uh, standards. And so when you realize that we already kind of skew, given the Patriot Act and, and the uh, Bank Secrecy Act, we already kind of skew that direction. And, and, and it's very clear that the government has been wanting to go this way of you know, monitoring financial transactions. Um, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that we are going to get this crazy um, dystopian uh, Big Brother-esque CBDC and it's, it's you know, maybe it won't be fully adopted in our lifetimes, maybe there'll be enough cash, but by the time our kids are 30, uh, I got to imagine that that cash is going to not, not really be a real thing anymore and this will be what people use. And the government can see that uh, you're spending extra money on Big Macs, you know, what, what are they going to... Micro increases in your health insurance premium right away, automatically. No, I, I mean, I think I too believe that it's inevitable. It's this dystopian Big Brother nightmare. Um, but there's a lot of potential, well, not a lot, but um, there are also potential benefits. You can cut out a lot of the middlemen, be a lot more efficient and lean system, but ultimately it's still the government calling shocks. So we'll still have some issues. Um, oh yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. Like the, those efficiencies will be there and they will uh, cut down on, on needless uh, waste, but just the, 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 just the nature of what it is, the, the, this, 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 this perfect ledger of everything that's ever happened. I don't know how they get around, even with the best intentions, I don't know how they get around not tracking every move of every dollar that you've ever spent. Yeah, yeah, and it's going that way. Um, it is what it is. Uh, I want to be very clear that I'm very bullish, for your listeners, I am very bullish on this space and I love this space. I don't want to sound negative. In no, that way. I mean, I, this, is, this is the antithesis of everything that crypto, it's taking the technology and using it for surveillance. Um, I'd be curious what your thoughts are on how that impacts Bitcoin and crypto and these other like outside of the system cryptocurrencies. Is, does it pose a risk because there's no fiat off ramp because that would be easily cut off? Like, how do you think through that? Well, I mean, like, like I said earlier, I think that uh, the, for, the, for the individual person who may have holdings in Bitcoin, I think that not being able to put it into a fiat currency is going to be, have very negative effects. I think we're past the point of no return with, with say, Bitcoin and ETH. Um, I don't think that it uh, I don't think it stops it. I don't think that it, you know, maybe, maybe it, it, I think it could hammer the price down 50% easily for a year or two, maybe three. Um, but the fact that you have institutional guys and, and you have got Grayscale buying up and PayPal buying up 100% of the new uh, minted coins. I mean, I think that at this point, even if, if you and I had to get out because we knew we needed to have money in our bank accounts to pay to live in the United States, when we sell, it's just going to go to those big guys. Um, and so I think that the overall value proposition for Bitcoin itself stays valid. I think it stays, to, it's going to have, it's no longer what was designed for this, this global uh, anonymous payment, uh, payment system. It's, it's an investment. It's, it's a store of value and it will stay that way. Um, it certainly becomes harder to transact, and it certainly uh, maybe scares off some of the people who should be benefiting from this, um, people who, who couldn't get access, who aren't accredited investors, who don't get to participate in the private markets, who could get 10x on an investment where they literally will never see that anywhere else in their life. Um, those are the people who should be getting exposure. It's not hedge funds that already have the stuff uh, anyway. You know. That they, they, they do get to participate in the private markets. They get to see regular companies 10x before they even hit the public markets. Um, but they're the ones who will be able to continue to participate if the, even if the little guy can. So, um, man, I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Within crypto, we talked about it. It's uh, very broad. What are the most interesting little niches or corners that, uh, that are fascinating you right now? Oh man, 
I've been obsessed with DeFi since before it was like really DeFi. I mean, I remember I sent you screenshots every morning uh, of, of uh, Instadap. What was that like early 2019, like, like July, January 2019. And I was like the only person in our little crypto chat who was actually like, hey, look, I can get 4% yield on something. And the people are like, what, it's not 10X? I don't care. And I'm like, rah, 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 this is fun. And then when it, when it exploded this year, I felt like a little prescient. I wish I'd had more money in it um because i was just messing around with small amounts but uh man coming from finance and seeing DeFi like slowly kind of eat traditional finance verticals has been so cool i mean when when um when when opens options first started to come out uh i was so so fucking jazzed um it was it was like, yes, we're going to start seeing real financial models here. And I don't think we're there yet, but um, I, I, to see this stuff, because I worked on the back end in, in finance. And I, I saw, you want to talk about inefficiencies and just insanity. I mean, we would lose 20, my, my first week, I lost a $26 million uh, T-bill. Um, and I, it took me a month. Part of that was because I didn't know exactly what I was doing yet, but it took me a month to find it. And it was just sitting in some other account within Merrill Lynch. It hadn't even gone anywhere, but no one knew where it was. So to see all that stuff get eaten up by this permissionless, immutable system in the hands of like some of the smartest people out there, the, you know, the computer science guys, man, that's cool. And, and I have, it, it really gets me, I start to nerd out um, as you am clearly already doing. Um, cause you know, the people who handle that stuff traditionally, I, I, I worked there, I could see the level of brain power that was going into it. Uh, and, and it, it's now, it's, it, it's now looking like it's in the right hands if we can kind of foster that. So I think DeFi is by far the, the most interesting, uh, area. Um, I am, I am, uh, dipping my toes into the whole NFT space and I'm, I'm slowly, uh, trying to wrap my head around it. I, I'm got a couple of clients who have uh, you know, paid me to start thinking about it, and uh, that it's fascinating. Um, I don't know how much I want to go down that route because I'm still there's still some some serious uh, uh, legal concerns that I have. Um, but from a from a from a uh, you know. A, an actual user from a from a crypto space fan, not a take my lawyer hat off. I think NFT the NFT space is really cool. I'm, my wife, my wife, who I have not been able to uh, really interest uh, in uh, in crypto, when I explained to her NFTs and then showed her a picture of one, we bought a digital uh, display like the next day and put it put a picture of an NFT we bought up like. That was an immediate reaction. I've been, you know, my, my, my wife can quote stuff on, on Bitcoin and crypto in general better than, than most of people in this country, uh, but she hasn't learned it willingly. It's because she tolerates me putting on podcasts when we drive places. She tolerates me go up, you know, spending time talking with you about it. Um, she, she knows when I'm, she, she calls it my chats because I'm sitting here scrolling through Telegram, like trying to figure out what the newest thing on Lobster Dow is. So she knows a lot, but uh what i think the first thing that grabbed her was like this this image the nft that she could buy and and you know it was hers and um so i, I think there's some real upside there absolutely and I've, I've done a number of podcasts on nfts in general i'll link uh i wrote an article on why digital art will be infinitely larger than traditional art i think it's it's really really cool space in, in indeed well, Dave, really appreciate having you on at round two. This was much better uh, and more seamless than the first one. So I'm glad glad we got the re the do over. But um, you too. shared a lot of great knowledge on regulations within the crypto space. I know you did a ton of stuff on cannabis as well. You've been working in the, in that industry for a long time, and I, I know we didn't go into much detail there. But if my listeners find interest in that sort of thing, uh, I'll. I'll definitely dive down that rabbit hole with you on the next one. But um, yeah. just in, in parting, where can my listeners find out more about you, about your for, firm? Where would you like to send them? 
Uh, I mean, the best place to find out about us is uh, the RodmanLawGroup.com. Um, and I'm happy, I'm proud to say that we have a, a uh, sort of a spin-off site that is sort of just a tiny little nub in the uh, decentralized web. So you can go to RodmanLaw.eth and it's a very bare bones uh, uh, site that will link you back to our actual real world site. Um, but we're also on Twitter at RodmanLaw and uh, you know, Facebook. Kind of wish I wasn't on Facebook, but it's got enough of a following that I can't really not be on Facebook anymore. Um, you can hit us up on LinkedIn too, um, but law firms are traditional. So the best way to get in touch with us is just to call us. Um, that's, that's legitimately the best way to get a hold of us, which is, I know sounds so Luddite, but um, yeah. I don't even think my iPhone can make calls. I'm just kidding. Awesome. Dave, it's been a pleasure. Great to see you. Glad to have you on. I'll link all those things in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks for having me, man. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like or even better subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.